Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Free Thought Hour. Now, I've got a couple of uh, business uh, items to deal with before we get started, because I want to introduce to you, first of all, my new co-host, Tercia. Welcome. I'm honoured to be here, John. Thank you so much. Well, we've we've already established a good relationship, I think, in the couple of weeks that we've known each other, and I'm looking forward to cooperating with you. And in fact, there's more news on this subject that we will deliver at the end of this show. Please remind me, if I, th if I look as I'm going to forget to do that, because we want to put out an announcement about, about next week, don't we? Yep. Good. So, but I'm going to take you down now because I want to introduce our proper guest. <laughs> I'm very pleased to announce that tonight our guest is an academic from South Africa. He's at the Cape Town University. He's a professor of, get this, neuropsychoanalysis. And the first question I'm going to ask him is, what's that? <laughs> anyway, here he is. Welcome, Mark Solomons. Thank you for being here. Well, how the devil are you? I can see that you're in the dark. Yes, that's right. Uh, we, we, I, I'm speaking to you from South Africa, uh, as, as, as you know, and uh, we have a power cut where I am at the moment. But fortunately, I have an uninterrupted power supply for my computer and also for this one lamp that's next to me. <laughs> good. <laughs> well, it's doing a good job anyway, as long as whatever fuel you're using doesn't run out. <laughs> so that's the first question. Mark, what is neuropsychoanalysis? Now, I know well, that that field, the, the field of what used to be, used to be known as uh, psychology, and it didn't really have any, we knew what it was, it was a department, and it didn't really have any vagueness about it at all. And then new technologies arrived, and it became possible to actually investigate inside the brain without invasing, invading it. And, and then also new treatments arrived with psycho drugs that uh, were effective. And the whole thing changed, and it's now sort of morphing into neuroscience. Am I right? Or well, you tell me. You're the expert. No, that's that's a pretty good uh, summing up. Um, so I I trained in the early 1980s um, in that branch of neuroscience called neuropsychology, um, and that's because what is really interesting about the brain. Uh, is that it's the organ of the mind. You know, somehow we, our very, our very selves, uh, this, this experiencing thing that we each are, uh, we are also a, a bodily organ. So, um, you know, what could be more interesting than that? How do I come into existence, my subjective experiencing being, uh, from the, the physiology uh, and anatomy of my brain? So I, yeah. I trained in that field uh, because I don't know why anyone would want to train in anything else. Yes. And, can, um, I, can I stop you there for a minute? Yes, because yes. I, I meet a lot of people who would argue that the brain is not the home of the mind and that the mind is some sort of, I don't know, some sort of supernatural, non-material thing. But I, I think like you, I think that the brain, the mind is what the brain does, rather like contraction is what muscles do. That's that's my biological, retired biology teacher view. Yeah, well, uh, I'll tell you, uh, in, in that case, I'll tell you why uh, I uh, came to that view, the view that you've just uh, stated yourself. That is when I was little, uh, j just going on five years old, my elder brother, uh, who was t uh, two and a bit years older than me, fell uh, from a three-story building uh, onto the concrete pavement below. He fell onto his head, uh, fractured his skull, uh, sustained an intracerebral hemorrhage. 
And uh, when he came back from the neurosurgery department, uh, he was not the same person. Um, he was radically changed. And so that's what confronted me with this fact that somehow we are our brains because the, the, my brother was no longer my brother. Uh, he was, as a person, he was changed. So it wasn't as if I decided there and then, um, you know, uh, that was in 1965. Uh, it wasn't that I decided there and then to become a neuroscientist, but I'm pretty certain that that's what motivated me uh, to, to try to... Uh, to try to understand this this mystery, because I grant you, it is a mystery of mm. how come that is true. How does it happen that our that our uh, our uh, our experiencing selves are also a, or are produced by a bodily organ? Now, you know, yeah. I, I mentioned that in the case of my brother, but since training in this field and working clinically in this field, I mean, I see patients every day. Yeah. whose minds are radically altered by brain disease, by brain yeah. surgery, and who yeah. lose their minds entirely, uh, you know, by which I mean go into a coma. It's entirely predictable. You know yeah. which parts of the brain, when mm. damaged, uh, are, are going to lead to the lo loss of, 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 of any experiencing mind uh, at all. So I, I think it's just simply a fact that yeah. uh, brains are the, our brains are, are the organs of our minds. I'm not going to argue with you, but I do meet a lot of these people who think that um, somehow or other there is an immaterial part of us, you know, that can survive after death. <laughs> and, and therefore the, the mind is a separate discontinuity from the brain. And it, is, it has been called a hard problem, hasn't it? So what do you have yes. to say about that? Well, it is a very hard problem. Uh, you know, that's why there's so many people who who hold views of the kind that you've just mentioned, because uh, it's it's you know it's easy for me to say, well, it's a simple observable fact uh, on the basis of the sorts of evidence I just mentioned. You know, that you can reliably and predictably tell uh, where, if a certain part of the brain is not intact, you can be sure that that there will be no conscious being there, uh, yes. and that. Uh, you can also reliably predict which aspects of consciousness will be lost with damage to different parts of the brain. Yes. But uh, that doesn't mean that we've solved the big problem of how yes. is it, how does it happen uh, that that mere uh, physiological activity in the in 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 the tissues of a, of a bodily organ uh, produce this this mm. uh, this mm. experiencing being. That is the hard problem uh, mm. of consciousness. And uh, it is it is the it is the 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 probably the biggest problem in science today. Yeah. Certainly yeah. in neuroscience, uh, to try yeah. to understand how on earth that, how on earth that conjunction mm. comes about. Yes, and one of your early interests was dreams, wasn't it? Yes. Um, the reason I, I was oh, go can ahead. I, can I just bring Tertia in here because she's uh, she's got a particular interest in this too, and I think one of her friends has got a question to put. Okay. Yes. Um, so my friend Risa, who lives in Claymont, also just down the road from where you and I are, well, um, she has mentioned before to me on Facebook, and I, I it, it tickles my mind as well. Um, she, she says that since she's had COVID, um, well, she's during her COVID um, while she was sick, and it's lasted since then, and it's been more than a year. She has these incredibly vivid, often frightening dreams. And something that when she described to me um, what it feels like, I said, well, I don't know, maybe I've had COVID because I've tested negative. But in the past four years or so, um, obviously that's not related to COVID, but I've also had these dreams where it feels as if I'm in a, a sort of a, in between stage, awake, asleep, dreaming. And I just had an experience like that again yesterday. I was looking for something in my office, um, a, a ribbon. And I remembered that I saw this ribbon somewhere. And then I stood here and I thought to myself, but I also remember dreaming that I'm doing this. And how, how the brain works and how consciousness works and how this talks into dreams, 
is, is just something that fascinates me because I'll tell you another thing. In preparing for tonight's show, I watched a good couple of your YouTube videos and um, I've had trouble sleeping lately. So I'd be awake until one o'clock in the morning watching videos and making notes and listening. And I kid you not, in one of my very vivid, weird, strange, awake dream type states, I dreamt about your videos and I dreamt that I'm watching and, and it's the weirdest feeling because at one level, and, and that's what Teresa says, it feels as if she's awake, but she knows she's dreaming and it's almost also as I'll wake up and I'll know I've been dreaming and then I'll go back to sleep and I'll pick up where I left off. Um, Astral projection, <laughs> Riaz, it says. Yeah. So I expect you you've had to listen to a lot of anecdotal descriptions of of symptoms like that, Mark. And we, we don't expect you to give a remote diagnosis tonight, but some some information about uh what is a dream. Well, um the dreams, uh, strangely enough. Um, are, and this touches exactly on what Tertia was just saying, uh, they're a kind of intermediate state. Oh, between right. sleep Sorry, I'm trying, trying to get you to the right position here. Okay, am I in the right position? Well, it's, it, it's because my producer's gone away at the moment. I'm trying to get you big screen and Tertia and I little screen, but uh, I'm not sure whether I press this button. No, this button. No, that's me. <laughs> this button. No, it doesn't. Sorry, you carry on. I'll put you center. <clears throat> uh, you seem to be unwittingly creating the situation that Tersha describes, where you don't know if you're in one state or another. Um, so, so dreams are intermediate uh, between deep sleep and and wakefulness. Um, they, 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 they. The fact that they mediate between the two is largely uh, responsible for the sorts of things that Tersh is speaking about. When we're in our deepest sleep, uh, uh, it's called slow wave sleep or non-REM sleep, um, there's very little dreaming going on then. Um, and and uh, when we're in REM sleep, which is when our brains are relatively aroused, or in the first few minutes after we go to sleep uh, at night, uh, and in the last couple of hours before we wake up, the common denominator between those three things, sleep onset, uh, REM sleep, and the late morning, you know, the late, late sleeping hours, uh, is arousal. The brain is relatively aroused, and that's when we dream. Um, and there's, there's even a good evidence that the dream is an attempt to keep us asleep. In other words, all the things that are disturbing our sleep, uh, the, the thoughts and the worries and the, uh, you know, various um, motivating uh, factors that that get us uh, up and running and and doing stuff in the world uh, mm -hmm. that dreams uh, enable us to do stuff in our imagination in the hallucinatory virtual reality of the dream yeah. so that we don't actually have to get up and really do stuff so so th that's uh, uh, that that's one way of, of of formulating what you're talking about but um, you know Tersha touched on many things there. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll just respond to one further uh, aspect of what she said, which is that when you have uh, a viral infection like COVID, it's nothing specific to COVID. I mean, if you have a temperature, uh, you dream more. Um, when you're ill, you dream more. Um, you know, it, it, and uh, this is because uh, the, the high temperature uh, and your body fighting off an illness, not to mention the worry, you know, my word, am I going to survive this illness? You know, mm. all those things disturb sleep, and that's why they they, they produce dreams. Mm. Well, uh, my anecdotal story here, I, I never remember having dreamt, uh, so I must be a very sound sleeper or something. Okay, but that's only... probably true, John. I must tell you that uh, the, the, best, uh, the, the best predictor uh, of how much dreaming you remember is how bad your sleep was. <laughs> ah, mm. okay, so if you I have one bad. occasion. Can I just say I have one occasion when I do remember dreaming, and it was when I was coming round from anaesthetic after having had uh, a heart operation, and I was on morphine. <laughs> I remember that. That was, gave me a very vivid dream. I could, I saw the four horsemen <laughs> by my bedside. 
Take Sorry, enough that's... morphine. Take enough morphine, and you'll dream while you're awake. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Tercia. I, I just find this. Let me just make sure that I've got this. So, if you're not a good sleeper, then you remember what you dream. Is that what you're saying, Mark? Yes, I'm afraid so. Okay, because that's very interesting. Because I um, remember my dreams often, and I've always remembered my dreams, and I've had these vivid dreams where things are so real that um, I, I wake up and then I think, uh, did I dream this or did it really happen? And I was recently diagnosed with quite severe sleep apnea. So um, it probably ties into that. And uh, it's interesting because my husband is one of those people. He puts his head down on the pillow and mm. I've timed him. And within five minutes, he'll be mm. completely gone. And he, well, he did dream once that he was playing rugby and he got hold of my head. <laughs> I, 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 said, I said, it's me, it's me, I'm not the ball. This, and, and he's a big I mean, he's a big guy, he's six foot six. And he actually had my head in a grip like that. And fortunately, I, fortunately, as I hope, also meant, I hope he didn't drop kick it. No, he didn't. And and fortunately, as we as you've said before in one of your other um, uh, talks that I listened to, your muscles don't respond that like they would normally when you're dreaming. Otherwise, I would have probably had serious injury, injuries with my husband grabbing my 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 head. Mm -hmm. But um, something else, and and I know we don't want to talk about dreams, but maybe your audience will enjoy this nonetheless, John, or our <laughs> audience. Um, and, and um, two things, and, and John, I know that we don't necessarily want to talk about religion and, and atheism because we have um, Professor Solomons to talk about how our brains work. But something that uh, that brings me, well, it doesn't have to go in that direction, but I've just spoken this week with a number of people who firmly believe in in the existence of the soul or the spirit, different names for it. And, and that belief is so deeply entrenched in, I, I think, in, in, in most people, um, because we cannot get away from this idea that there has to be something that continues after, after we've gone. And so much of religion is based on that. And um, the, the, the fact that we can't cope with this idea that once my brain shuts down permanently, there's no me. Uh, even even something like like abortion, you know, when people speak about abortion, um, it's this what what underpins a lot of those ideas is this this idea that our brains are special also, um, whereas science has shown us that you can cats dream, um, dogs dream. Yes. Um, so we, we are not unique in, in that respect. And maybe, Mark, you can um, speak a little bit to the primitive structures of our brains, mm -hmm. uh, especially, I hope there's some young earth creationists and anti-evolutionists listening, just so that we can really tell them that, that my brain shares structures with uh, fish and, uh, and reptiles and, and something like, like that, you know. Well, you, you only have to have a pet to realize how similar we are to them. And, and yes, dogs do dream and you can watch them. And I've not actually seen a dog, dog sleepwalk, but Mark, can you say something about that? Do you know anything about sleepwalking? Um, what Tersha described earlier about her husband treating her head as if it were a rugby ball, that's a little bit like sleepwalking uh, because oh. of course, normally when, normally when we, when we are, uh, asleep and especially during dreaming sleep, uh, our, our muscles from the neck down uh, are, are temporarily paralyzed, so you can't move uh, during during normal dreaming. Uh, so most sleepwalking, in fact, doesn't happen during dreams. Uh, it, it happens in 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 the deeper sleep when we are less likely to be paralyzed, um, or otherwise, if we have a thing called REM behavior disorder, uh, which is when that paralysis uh, fails, the paralysis that we should have while we're dreaming. Uh, if, if, if that paralysis fails, then, then it, it, it causes... Um, actually, usually um, in human beings, usually aggressive behavior. 
um, oh. but it can it can it can cause all sorts of instinctual behaviors like freezing and fleeing and uh, crying and so on uh, oh. but but uh, so so there's a there's a range of different uh, different things uh, that we're talking about uh, but most sleepwalking uh, that doesn't is not accompanied by dreams um, no. unless there's REM behavior disorder in which case it is um, and then the behaviors are usually quite emotional and in human beings uh, usually quite aggressive oh mm. well and there's something else that i read today this very day that um is connect well we're on the subject of sleep and the abnormalities of it or disorders of it tinnitus apparently has been linked to sleep i don't know whether you've uh, picked up on this it seems to be some fairly recent uh, research or connection yeah i'm afraid uh, there you've told you've told me something john I've, I've i'm not aware of there being any connection uh, i wouldn't be surprised i mean mm. a lack of sleep is very bad for you it leads to all sorts of physical ailments so mm -hmm. um if your chances of developing tinnitus are increased by virtue of sleep disorders i, I wouldn't be surprised but actually that's a piece of research i i'm i'm not familiar with wow ah. mm. Well, can, I, can I ask something? Well, the, the, it, I just um, remembered something. Uh, the phenomenon of um, uh, sleep paralysis. Yes. Uh, how, how, how common that is in terms of pop, uh, population distribution? And, and is that in that, in that same, is, is it sort of the opposite of, of, of sleep, the sleepwalking state? Because I've heard many people describe that. And it it accounts for much of the belief in 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 something like an evil spirit, where people say um, that they wake up and they feel something pressing on their chest and they can't move, and and it's a very frightening um, experience, and it's very real. Uh, how 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 does that uh, relate to sleep and dreaming and waking states and 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 things like that? So what, what we're talking about uh, uh, is a group of uh, phenomena called parasomnias. Uh, 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 parasomnias, uh, there are a range of them. Uh, one of them is um, what, what I was describing earlier, like REM behavior disorder, where uh, you should be paralyzed and you're not. Uh, so you, you, you act out uh, the, 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 um, the content of the dream. So the, 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 those are things which should be happening together. Dreaming should be happening together with sleep paralysis. If the sleep paralysis is missing, uh, th then you have a parasomnia, in other words, REM behavior disorder. But it can happen the other way around, that, you, that the sleep paralysis carries on after you wake up. Um, and that's a very frightening situation where you're awake, but you absolutely cannot move. So again, it's these things, the, the orchestration of these different uh, physiological variables uh, going, going out of kilter. Uh, what you described uh, about the pressure on the chest, which is called the incubus phenomenon, uh, mm. th that is also a parasomnia. Uh, and it's, it has to do with the partial paralysis, um, uh, uh, the, the feeling of the onset of the paralysis um, before one is properly asleep. And so you have the experience you know, of, of it feels like there's a pressure on your chest. In different cultures, uh, it's it's described as a you know as, as a people uh, depending on their culture and the, the the kind of belief system that they subscribe to, uh, they, they they will describe that very same phenomenon either in purely physiological terms. You know that I I felt something uh, uh, changing in my breathing and in the musculature of my chest. Other people will say a demon, you know, descended upon me. Uh, in in Southern Africa, there's this uh, the the belief in the tokolosh, um, which is a, 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 a clearly a cultural description of a, a, a little man who comes and uh, jumps on your chest. Uh, it's clearly a description of the incubus phenomenon, but it's a purely physiological thing. It's a parasomnia. It has to do uh, with the um, the failure. Uh, of these various things to happen together that should. Another one of them uh, is that when you wake up uh, and you carry on, the hallucination of the dream doesn't stop. Uh, so uh, wow. uh, some people have 
they wake up and they're still in the dream, which means yes. they're kind of awake and not awake at the same time. They, lucid, they're all very interesting, these parasomnias. Is that lucid dreaming? No, lucid dreaming is not considered a parasomnia. Lucid dreaming is uh, when you're dreaming and know that you're dreaming. Uh, oh. And, and, and uh, you know, you, normally when you're dreaming, you, 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 you think it's real. Um, yes. And it's only when you wake up, you realize, gosh, that was a dream. But mm. in lucid dreaming, uh, you, you, even in the dream, you realize this can't be real. This must be a dream. And uh, then you can also guide the content of the oh. dream to, to a certain extent. You can make things happen in your dream that you would like to happen. You can direct the movie. That sounds like fun. Can, is, there, yeah. is there a drug that can induce that? <laughs> There, there's, there's not a drug for, that induces lucid dreaming, but uh, you can train yourself to become a lucid dreamer. Uh, oh. there are some people are just born like that. Um, uh, and, and even the most talented lucid dreamer uh, sometimes has ordinary dreams. Uh, oh. But us regular folk uh, who, who are not lucid dreamers, with a bit of training, we can have some lucid dreams. So, wow. so it's it's within the it's within the sort of uh, realm of, of of things that human beings can do. <laughs> Interesting. There's a there's a Hollywood opportunity there, surely. <laughs> so, um, oh, go ahead, Tersia. No, I wanted to to get to this whole thing of psychoanalysis. Ah, um, so did I. Yes. Uh, yes. So, John, please inter uh, interrupt me if you if you want, but. Uh, what I know about Freud is that he's in the, he's, I, I never thought that, um, you know, he'd be credited in this day and age as a, as a real yes. scientist. Uh, yeah. And there's, a, um, but I, I have learned in the past couple of weeks and not only from, um, uh, Mark's work that there, there is new research that, that shows that some of the ideas that, that our good friend Dr. Freud had um, were not that far off the mark um, mm. and that he was perhaps in some respects um, he, he was his time ahead and that if, if he were alive today he might, with the uh, machinery and the techniques that we have today of, of investigating the brain he he might have we might be able to give him um, the more credit, credit. That he, yes more, more credit um, and and then this whole thing of talk, of therapy um, and and combining the if I, am I right if I say that um, uh, neuropsychoanalysis is sort of a combination of what we know about the phys phys physiology of our brains combined with the ideas of Freudian talk therapy. Um, am, well, am I, we've got the very man. We've got the very man here to answer that question. But and, before before we invite him to do that, I'd like to bring something to this table because I interviewed Dr. Darrell Ray a year or so ago, who he is a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. And so I asked him at my usual sort of first question: What is that specialism, uh, and I, I referenced Freud and Jung, and I said, is it anything to do with them? And he said, hell no. <laughs> he was very much against um, accepting ancestry of, um, you know, Austrian early people who, who didn't have any means to actually investigate inside the brain while it's alive. Or, or any medications that they could use much in controlled circumstances to influence it. I mean, obviously they had mushrooms and things, but the, the, I don't suppose the, 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 the knowledge of how to dose and control the experiment was available back then. So, yes, Mark, what is <laughs> neuropsychoanalysis? Is it some sort of synthesis? Yes, it's a, uh, it's a synthesis and it's a very necessary synthesis uh, precisely because of the sorts of things, you know, that, that, that you're both saying. The, I, I, there's something about uh, Freud uh, which, which makes people either deify him, you know, or, or demonize him. Uh, mm. Freud was the pioneer uh, of, a, of, of, of the study of the mind, um, yes. just as Darwin was the pioneer 
you know, yeah. in, in evolutionary biology. Newton was the pioneer oh. in, in physics. You know, nobody says, uh, you know, if, if you say to a modern physicist, um, you know, do, do you do, do you still subscribe to Newtonian mechanics? Uh, you, you would have to say no. You know, Newton didn't. You know, uh, uh, it's all changed since then. You know, we don't we don't think in Newtonian terms now. We think in quantum mechanical terms. Uh, uh, Darwin knew nothing about it, it, genetics, for example. No. Genetics, you know, didn't even exist in Darwin's no. time. Darwin didn't even know the laws of inheritance. So, no. you know, Freud was a pioneer. He got, he sketched a sort of broad lay of the land. Uh, and we've moved on enormously since then. Uh, but why do people want to uh, 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 sort of um, uh, jettison the, 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 the heritage of our field? Uh, I think it's because this field, uh, it's not studying things out there. It's studying us, you know, yes. and uh, we get, we have very, um, we have skin in the game. You know, we, 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 we feel uh, very strongly about uh, these, these theories. But neuropsychoanalysis exists precisely because of this split, that there are people uh, who study the mind uh, in, in all of its uh, qualitative richness, uh, psychologically, they study its uh, its subjective uh, uh, aspects, uh, and then uh, there are people like your other guest, you know, who want who want only to speak about neurotransmitters uh, and 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 brains, uh, and and clearly, you know, these are two, in my view, these are two different perspectives upon the same part of reality. Yep. Uh, if you, when I wake up in the morning uh, with my eyes closed, I feel myself to be Mark Solms. That's my mind. Yep. And then yes. I stagger over to the bathroom and I see this thing in the mirror. That's my body. It's also yes. Mark Solms. You know? yes. So these are just two different observational perspectives on the same part of reality. The, the internal subjective observational perspective, the being of the brain, uh, yes. and the external objective cool. observational perspective, you know, which is the organ of the brain. And uh, you know, to, uh, my, my, my view is, well, why don't we use both? You know, wh wh why, why must one subscribe to, now this is not a football game, you know, we're not, we, we don't say I support this team or I support that oh. team. This is science where we yes. have to use all the tools that we have and all the evidence that we can gather. Each method has its strengths and its weaknesses. Oh. So, you know, um, it's like the moral of the blind man and the elephant. And one person yes. gets of the tail and the other one the ear and the other one the belly and they, they each think, uh, very differently about what the object is that they that they uh, uh, groping at, uh, and if they combined their different uh, bits of evidence, they would they would get an integrated picture of the whole. So oh. that neuropsychoanalysis is trying to get beyond all of these schisms in the mental sciences, and trying to see the big picture. Do you use a cow? <laughs> I, I was just going to ask that. So I was going to ask. So if you treat somebody. Do you hook them onto a um, fMRI machine in your uh, that's attached to a couch? <laughs> listen, to them, listen to them talk while they're in an FM, fMRI machine. How, how, how would? Um, well, firstly, do you? Do, is it a, is it a treatment? Is neuro neuropsychoanalysis a, a, a treatment? Um, is it a? a so, so could I, for example, say I I want to. Uh, come for treatment and, and what will that type of treatment uh, if it is um, entail I, I have no idea I've, I've got a cartoon in my head now of a, a couch a patient with a couch going through the tunnel of an MRI scanner <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so um, the the answer is uh, that we we don't have any one treatment we use a range of treatments uh, this is uh, along the lines of what I was saying earlier you know it's, it's not a it's not a matter of um, which which team do you support? Uh, it's it's a matter of well, what works for whom? You know, mm. um, mental health is a very big field. Uh, there's some disorders for which the, the the best treatment, and sadly, the only treatment uh, is is pharmacological. Uh, and there are other disorders where the best treatment is psychological. Uh, mm. And under psychological therapies, there are a great many psychological therapies. Some of which are uh, you know, very brief, um, and others of which are very long, intensive treatments. 
And yes. it's really a question of, I think it's sort of common sense uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, just as in general medicine, you know, there's not, you know, I believe in antibiotics. And well, you know, if I have cancer, I don't want to be treated with antibiotics. I want to be treated, you know, with, with chemotherapy. Um, it depends on what, what disorder you have. There are different treatments for different things. Uh, so yes. the same applies in the mental health field. Colossus um, for colossus. Yes. Well, you're right in, in that we all wake up and we're inside here and we're looking out from here. And that gives us a necessarily egocentric view. And historically, that, that's been responsible for all sorts of things, for men becoming demagogues, um, uh, megalomaniacs, believing that the, everything goes around planet Earth, you know, and all, all of these erroneous ways of um, explaining what's happening. But that, that leads me to this comment from one of our viewers. Thank, thank you for watching us, Rudolf. Challenge for us is the explanation of our consciousness are all objective, but we don't feel like brains, neurons, cells, or atoms. Instead, subjectively, we feel like we're immortal souls. I often get encounters with people who want to reduce everything down to atoms and say, it's not possible for atoms to do thinking. Well, they've missed out a, a huge progression of complexity, <laughs> increasing sophistication when they say that. <laughs> yes, you know, um, the, the the right level of analysis, um, uh, I think, is the issue here. Of course, we are made of atoms, um, you know, and those atoms combine uh, in certain molecular uh, 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 units uh, which combine to make you know different uh, tissues uh, and different organ systems and so on uh, at the level of the nervous system you're talking about a system you're not talking about atoms anymore nor are you talking about cells you know nor, nor are you talking even about one organ or one or one nucleus you know you're talking about the whole system and so the level of analysis then uh, becomes not the atom uh, of course, you're made of atoms, but you can't understand the functions of the brain by using uh, th that level of analysis. Um, it's it's like saying, you know, uh, let's try and explain the weather by 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 studying the atoms. You know, the weather is a is a much uh, higher yes. level phenomenon, a much more yeah. complex phenomenon, and so you need you know meteorology to study the weather, not 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 uh, atomic physics. So and you, uh, you need yeah. huge computers to deal with all yes. the variables too. Yes. yes. So I was watching a, a speech by Dan Dennett that he gave back in 2017 at the Royal Institute this afternoon, in which he was discussing is the brain a computer, and and, and he came to the conclusion that it's not a computer like we've known because they are designed by some agent, clever computer designer, uh, and it's a top-down structure that, that's being created. We're more like, our brains are more like, he said, a, a an ant's nest, where there's lots of individuals that don't know what they're doing, but they're sort of co cooperating together and making something wonderful. What do you think of that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think two different things. Uh, the, the one is that we must be careful of uh, metaphors uh, that the, the brain is uh, a computer uh, or the brain is a anything other than a brain. Uh, because if you look at the history of our science, of neuroscience, uh, you see uh, that, um, you know, in the 18th century, uh, the, 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 bra the brain was supposed to be like a pneumatic machine you know because yeah. the, the, that was the kind of the most complex uh, mm -hmm. sort of um, uh, technology that, that that we that we had uh, was at that level and then yes. it became oh it's it's a it's a telegraph uh, and then it was it's a telephone exchange you know oh. and 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 now it's now it's a computer we can we can um of course we use these analogies but we must never forget that they are just analogies yeah. um yes. The, all, the, all analogies are wrong, aren't they? Let's face it. Well, they're, they're useful, but as, as long as we remember that they are just analogies. The, to yeah. say the brain, you know, that 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 understand that the 
because each of those steps that I just went through uh, in terms of the analogies that we used over the history of my field, you know, each yeah. one, the, each new analogy was somewhat better than the one before. Yes. Um, you know, so so the the you know we do we 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 we, we can use these analogies, but we must just remember uh, there's a lot about the brain uh, that that you know that isn't exactly like a computer. Um, uh, the 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 uh, the digital information processing aspect of the brain um, is is certainly that you do explain a good deal of what goes on, especially at the cortical level. But then there's a lot about the brain which has which is all about its embodied uh, nature uh, and yes. all about the you know the direct chemical uh, relationship between the tissues of the brain and the tissues of the rest of the body. Yes. Um, and and uh, the, the, there the analogy, um, it's, it becomes less useful and it becomes, you know, better to think about the brain in, in, in other terms. Yes. Um, we, we couldn't really be a brain in a jar, could we? Because we really need to have eyes and ears and things attached. Yes. Tercia, yeah. you were saying about um, so, some people think that we have a soul. And I'm, I'm wondering, because... That makes me think about the private mind, you know, because we are ourselves. And the, until we get, a, you know, a USB port in our necks, we can't share our experiences. There, there's no, you can't lift off the top of the head and find out what another person's doing in there, can you? So you were going to say something about, uh, you were waving at me, putting your hand up. Have I, um, have I touched on it or? You, you have um, so that the idea that we never mind. Um, I, I would like to take it one step further. Mm -hmm. Just, I, I sometimes wonder whether we can actually um, investigate our own thought processes and to what to what extent we can do that. Uh, and uh, when we think about analogies, uh, they all fail at some point. At some point, all metaphors yes. break down. They don't work anymore. So I would like to uh, steer the conversation in, into a little bit more maybe practical uh, application. I don't know if it's at all possible when we talk about our brains. But I just learned last week that May is actually um, Mental Health Awareness Month. So maybe oh. it's, it, uh, yes, um, I, Trevor Noah mentioned that on his show. And when we think about our brains, um, and that our brains, uh, our minds are what our brains do, and that what our brains, uh, what we do, have an impact on reality, then it makes me think of things like um, in South Africa we have this crime problem, and how, how does our brains and how our brains function and work speak to things like free will and addiction? And um, things like uh, mental mental disease, what we call um, mental illness, and and even something like uh, responsibility. So so to what extent um, ca can, uh, if we think about that horrible um, incident in Buffalo, New York, to, to what extent are we responsible, and to what extent are we victims of our own? internal programming a bio biochemistry um and and can we can we change that can we control it um so i, I know um, I, i'm quite a fan also of the work of robert sapolsky which is different obviously but it, it, to me I, I always want to know how does this uh, how does the academic knowledge of of um people in academia how does it apply to the real world um, to the people that are sleeping on the uh, square one block down from my, my house, you know. Um, how does this knowledge speak to how I approach other people, for example? Mm. I, I think that um, the, the, the uh, most relevant uh, uh, thing to say in, in relation to these very big questions that, that, you're, that you're asking um, is, first of all, we have various uh, emotional drives, various emotional needs. I mean, some of them are very well known to us, like the need to escape danger, you know, which is a, which is a, a drive to, to safety. 
the, the need to get rid of frustrating impediments, uh, which is which is aggression. You know, if there's something standing between me and and what I need to get to, then you know, then then you you become frustrated and irritated and angry with that thing. Uh, to be separated from a loved one, that sort of panicky separation distress. You know, there 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 are these basic emotional uh, needs that that every human being has and not only human beings you know their their emotional mm. needs as we were speaking about our pets earlier you know animals have basic emotional needs too yes. and we understand a great deal about uh, the 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 chemistry of those of those uh, those drives and this is why psychopharmacological drugs act on these chemicals that the, the, those yes. drives give rise to our feelings and to the feelings of of different types um but then there's what do you do about those emotional needs? We, we each of us, so we're all born with them. Uh, then each of us has to learn from experience how to satisfy those needs, how, how, how to go about um, uh, um, meeting our emotional needs, or to put it in a different language, how to go about regulating our, our emotional uh, urges. And uh, that's the part that you are personally responsible for. Um, you know, you. So some of us have stronger or, or weaker. Uh, like some kids are just born and more anxious than others. Some are more clingy than others. Some are more aggressive than others. So you know, that's what. Those are the cards that that you are dealt. Uh, then, then, then there's the business of okay, what am I going to do about that? Uh, how how am I going to go about the business of managing my feelings? Uh, that is to say, going about meeting our emotional needs. And I I think that. Um, uh, you know, because we are not all um, uh, we're not all dealt the same hand uh, mm. of cards. It's harder for some of us than it is for the, for others of us. But I'm I'm of the view that ultimately uh, you do have to take responsibility for what you do about your emotional needs. So you know, if you've had a if you, if you because of your 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 particular circumstances, you're more frustrated and more uh, angry uh, than the next person. Doesn't mean that therefore you're not responsible for for you know for for being violently uh, aggressive to your fellow humans. So um, it's the so and also these two the, the the chemical systems, the drives which we feel as these emotional urges. Uh, that's sort of the. The, the psychopharmacological side of our field and then this thing of learning from experience how to manage these feelings that's the psychotherapeutic side and so you can treat it uh, you know uh, also uh, from from both directions depending on um, on on different etiological factors in other words where where the source of the trouble is we're, we're in danger there of getting into two things one is um uh, what is it called? Um, where, where you uh, the, the effect of a placebo, the placebo effect, where where the brain is actually doing the medication for you, and some some placebo experiments do work as a result of that. And the other thing I was you touched on that made me think is we're, we're considering getting a dog right now and. If you look at the different breeds, you can pick one that is very dependent, that really doesn't like to be left alone, that will, you know, eat your furniture if you leave it for a couple of minutes. Or you can pick one that's more independent and is quite happy to be yeah. in. Just a cat. Don't get a dog. Just a cat. <laughs> <laughs> the um, placebo, yeah. effect is, placebo effect is terribly interesting. Um, the the uh, just in in case uh, uh, anyone in the audience is not sure what 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 placebo means so when you when you're trying out a a, a, a testing new drugs uh, mm. you need to you need to compare uh, what what the drug does with what a false drug does in other words a, a, a patient thinks they're taking a drug uh, but really what they're taking uh, is is an inactive agent uh, mm. And so the placebo effect is that sometimes the inactive agent um, has uh, a therapeutic benefit, and so you know that's that's a very interesting fact. So it doesn't uh, placebo doesn't work equally well with everything. There's certain kinds of certain conditions where 
uh, where where placebo is more uh, 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 effective than others. Pain is one. Uh, uh -huh. you know, placebo placebo uh, it, it does a good deal for pain. Uh, depression is another one. Uh, the, the, the placebo effect is quite powerful in in uh, in depression. And That's this all, yeah, this uh, and, and you know there there are other examples I could give, but the the the, the underlying uh, explanation for all of this uh, is uh, that uh, in fact placebo effect is not nothing. Uh, the we've studied. Uh, what goes on in the brain uh, when you when you take placebo, uh, mm -hmm. and there are chemical changes in your brain because you think you've taken a drug, uh, and th th those those chemical changes are of two kinds. Uh, the one is that it ra uh, do there's a chemical called dopamine, uh, yes. which increases when you take placebo, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's there's a there's another chemical uh, which are a, a group of chemicals called called endorphins, in particular. Uh, mu opioids uh, they yeah. go up and uh, those are each of them are part of those basic emotional systems that i was talking about earlier uh, dopamine uh, is this optimism it's the drive there's a drive uh, uh, called seeking which is just a sort of a positive engagement with the world in the expectation that if i go out there and do stuff my needs will be met yeah. uh, and so so the the, uh, the 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 increase in dopamine is Due to your increased optimism, I've taken a drug. I'm going yes, to get yes. better, yes. and so you know you, you, your dopamine goes up. And the yes. mu opioids have to do with attachment, with with the uh, uh, you know us mammals need to be loved and cared for and looked yes. after. Uh, yes. And when you when you are looked after, your mu opioid levels go up. So if you if, if a doctor's giving you a placebo and you think oh good this doctor's looking after me, your mu yes. opioid levels go up. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, what, what you're saying, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, is that if I think I'm taking something that's going to make me feel a certain way, my brain, my brain is literally going to produce that chemical. But <laughs> exactly. But this goes back to what we were talking about uh, at the very beginning of our conversation, uh, you know, that, that every feeling uh, is also a chemical. Uh, you know, just as I said, when I wake up in the morning and I feel myself to be Mark Solms, and then I go and I look at myself in the mirror and I see yes. this physiological anatomical body, uh, that yes. is because the, the, we have two different observational perspectives on ourselves. The feelings are the way in which we subjectively uh, get to know that our, do our dopamine is going up or our mu opioid receptor yes. binding is going up. Well, here's an interesting Sorry, here's an interesting. Thank you. Here's an interesting spin-off from that because it's in this country at least it's not considered ethical for a doctor to actually prescribe a placebo, but presumably you could self-medicate and kid yourself but into thinking. No, that, well, when you know it's a placebo, then you don't have that optimism oh, and you don't it doesn't work. It, so yes. it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's like you well, can't tickle yourself. <laughs> yes, yes. So what do you think about the ethics? Do you think doctors should be allowed to prescribe placebo? No, but I'll tell you what I do think. I think that um, we should not lose sight of the psychological aspect of, of, of medicine. You know, to, to feel cared for uh, mm. is, 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 is therapeutic. Uh, mm. And so, you know, this idea that we can just have an online NHS uh, and everything can be driven by algorithms, uh, you know, and that you don't mm. actually have to go and visit a doctor. Uh, yes. I, I think that that, that 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 aspect, just the relationship with a human being who's actually who's actually trying their best for you yes. and, 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 you know, and cares about you. It is yeah. part. I don't want to say that that's, you know, that that's enough, but no. it is part of what of what the makes our patients better. Yeah, so it's it's a good bedside manner, isn't it? So do you think doctors should have training in that? And do you think it can come across on Zoom like this? Or do you think uh, it has to be flesh? Well, you know, uh, I think that we all were, uh, well, I should speak for myself. I, I was um, very uh, against uh, telemedicine, you know, this kind of uh, uh, treating patients by Zoom and so on. Um, mm. Until we all had to do it uh, during uh, the pandemic, 
Mm. And uh, I, I then learned, well, you know, you can achieve a lot more than I would have than I would have thought. I, I, I think mm. I was I was yeah. I was unnecessarily prejudiced. But of yeah. course, you know, you can achieve more with a real consultation than a than a Zoom consultation. Yes. And you can yes. achieve more in a Zoom consultation than in a telephone call. And you can right. achieve more in a telephone call than talking to a robot. You know? Yes. So, so what's, so what's the, the metric? What's the metric here? How are we going to measure this and evaluate it? Well, there are studies. There's quite a few because of the pandemic, you know, and, mm. and, and also because mm. of the increasing pressures, you know, mm. on healthcare systems and so on. There are studies... Uh, in, uh, I, I would say the jury's still out, but luckily there are studies going on looking mm. into the, 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 the these things. In the Dan Dennett lecture that I watched, he showed us pictures of our near relatives, you know, the orangutan, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and he pointed out that we're the only ones of the anthropoid apes that have whites to our eyes. They all have just the colored bits. You can't see any whites. And mm -hmm. the, the speculation is that that's because if you've got whites to the eyes, you can see a person's gaze, which is much more engaging. You know that you've got their attention. So I thought that was an interesting thing to throw yes. in here. Uh, 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 Dan Dennett is a friend of mine, and he's just completely mm -hmm. brilliant. You know, he's a yes, he's yes. a philosopher who should have been an engineer. You know, or is yes, he yes. some kind of some kind of strange combination of a of a natural he's, scientist and a, and a philosopher? But a I'll, true, you know, a true polymath. He knows a bit about everything. He really he really is a polymath. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'll tell you what I find more interesting that, uh, about our eyes in relation to uh, our, our primate cousins uh, is that we're the only species that cries. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, other, other mammals and other primates show separation distress, but they don't produce tears. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they have tear ducts, which are... Which are which um, lubricate the eye, yeah. but they 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 don't cry uh, tears. It's a this wow. is a uniquely human phenomenon. So I think that it's is quite so interesting. Yeah, I, I want to just qualify something that you said about the interaction, Mark, and I think yes. it just goes to show how incredibly complex we are. Because I think that a, a virtual interaction with a person that you know shares your ideas and is very sympathetic could probably be more beneficial than a face-to-face -face interaction with somebody that you experience as being aloof or um, not sympathetic. So I, I think um, I think that we've developed and to, to in, in, the, in recent months that we, we've actually, because of the internet, we can connect with people that we know feel and think the same way that we do and that a conversation via Zoom for an hour with somebody that I know agrees with me is probably more beneficial for my mental health um, than than having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody who I feel is hostile towards me or doesn't agree with me. So, yeah. yes. kinship. Well, I agree. I think the main point that Tersh is making is that you know we shouldn't think about. Um, about clinical care in purely instrumental terms, the quality of the relationship matters, and uh, and whether that relationship is delivered by Zoom or in person, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's more important what kind of relationship it is yes. than what medium is used uh, uh, to um, to deliver it. Well, we could, we could we could now go on to empathy if we're not careful, but we've done an hour, and and I'm going yes. to be quite strict because. I, I don't want to get a reputation for somebody who lures people into an hour's conversation and keeps them for the rest of their life. <laughs> so, Well, I've, I, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you very much for coming. It's been wonderful. I've, uh, I, it's a privilege to me to have academic guests to talk to, an opportunity to pick inside your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Sorry? Subjectively and objectively. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. In the dark and in the light. <laughs> yes, whatever that means. Yes. I, I just, before I say 
before I say thank you and goodbye, I want to flag up next week because I'm on holiday. I'll be in the West Country and Tercia is going to lead on the Free Thought Hour. <laughs> so can you say a little bit about what who you're guesting with next week or who's your guest when you're host? Uh, John, first, we don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, we are South Africans are taking over. Uh, so <laughs> myself and Mark. And next week, it's just going to be a bunch of South Africans. It's going to be me <laughs> and a friend of mine that I met on Facebook, Laurie Clarsen. And he's going to tell us about his escape from a very fundamentalist South Korean wow. Christian. Yes. Uh, Shion Ji, something like that. And he was yeah. in the Chilans. He was a pastor. Um, yes. He ran, planted several church in Namibia. And yes. he's going to tell us about that. So uh, that's right. I can't yes. say that. Yeah. So it's the takeover of these South Africans. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to tell the Queen, and you will see a Royal Navy gunboat off the coast very soon. I can't wait as long as the Queen is with it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you've been wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed it tonight. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you to our, thank you to our audience. We, we're getting some thanks coming in now from. Uh, from people in different parts of the world who have been watching us. And there will be many more who will see us when we become a podcast the minute I stop live streaming. So I'm going to play the outro, if I can find it. Oh, welcome back, Steve, when you finish looking after your puking baby. Bye-bye, <laughs> guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.